Back in the day, a woman's place was as the singer, or maybe as the backup singer. Put on something nice and frilly and just stand there and sing, honey. The men will take care of the real work of writing the songs and playing the instruments. Uh, you, you want to do something? Oh, okay. Uh, uh, shake this tambourine. Really, that's the way it was for years. Chicks could sing and dance, but that was it. But as the 60s wound down, that began to change. The whole women's lib thing extended to rock, and the world began to realize that women were every bit as capable as men when it came to rocking out. A few pioneers showed up playing the guitar. Then props to Karen Carpenter of the Carpenters. The music gave you diabetes, but Karen was a drummer. I mean, a chick playing drums. I, I can't even begin to tell you how radical and weird that was back in the early 1970s. And by the mid-70s, the last bastion of male domination, the bass, was being invaded by women such as Tina Weymouth of the Talking Heads. And after that, it was inevitable that a bunch of women would get together and form an all-female rock band, which, of course, happened. Now, it took a while for this whole concept to earn respect, but thanks to some major perseverance and some very good music, the idea of an all-female rock band isn't as foreign as it used to be. Let me show you. This is part two of New Rock's greatest all-female band. Now, the ongoing history of new music. California. Those are the Donnas with Take It Off from their 2002 album Spend the Night. Four women all using the name Donna. Kind of like four guys from New York all using the name Ramon. Know what I mean? Anyway, we'll get back to the Donnas a little bit later on. Welcome to the show. I'm Alan Cross and this is the second half of a look at the greatest and most important all-female bands in the history of new rock. Not female solo artists like Patti Smith or Liz Fair or female fronted bands like Hole or Evanescence, we're talking about bands where the Y chromosome and estrogen are 100% dominant. Now, there's still some marginalization going on. The concept of a rock band made up of nothing but women is still either A, a novelty and curiosity for some, or B, completely and totally weird. 
the fact that we're doing a program on this kind of you know proves the point. But at the same time, it's important that we point out these contributions and efforts made by these people because they have helped break down gender barriers and stereotypes. On part one, we acknowledge the works of the earliest pioneers, the runaways, the slits, the go-go's, the raincoats, and uh, uh, even Josie and the Pussycats. Now we're going to pick things up in the late 1980s. The great grunge explosion was about to hit. And one of the things that we learned during grunge was that there was no reason that women couldn't have a piece of the action. Let's begin with L7. Originally from Los Angeles, that's L7 with Andre, a single from their 1994 album, Hungry for Stink. They came together in 1985 and were eventually signed by Epitaph, the legendary punk label, in 1988. By 1991, they had been lumped into the whole grunge thing, mainly because they had signed with Sub Pop Records and because they started playing gigs with bands like Hole and Pearl Jam and Nirvana. And when Nirvana took off, L7 was sucked up into their slipstream, getting a new major label deal and recording an album called Bricks Are Heavy with Butch Vig, the same guy who produced Nevermind for Nirvana. L7 gained a rep as a hard-working, hard-partying rock and roll band who just happened to be all-female. They traveled the world, toured with Lollapalooza, played the biggest festivals in the UK, and even starred in a documentary about their experiences called The Beauty Process, which was made by Chris Novoselic, the bass player with Nirvana. And while they were around, their brand of girl power showed a lot of women how much could be done without any guys involved. The same thing can be said for Babes in Toyland. They were formed in Minneapolis in 1987 and could be every bit as hard and as in-your-face as any all-male band. Feminism wasn't necessarily any kind of theme because with Babes in Toyland, it was all about turning it up and rocking out. The singer's name was Kat Bjelland, and you know what? <laughs> you just didn't mess with her. There's this legendary story 
about how she expressed her disgust with a record company executive by doing something on his desk. I'd like to tell you what she did, but we can't talk about those things on the radio. Let's just say that this executive probably found himself a new desk that afternoon. Babes in Toyland is also related to both L7 and Hole. They shared a bass player at one point, and before she formed Hole, Courtney Love was a member of Babes in Toyland during the days the band was based in San Francisco. Like L7 and Hole, the Babes were sucked into the whole grunge thing in the early 1990s. Because of some issues with their record company, they probably fell short of what they could have done, but that doesn't mean they didn't release some pretty good music, and that they didn't influence other women looking to rock as hard as the guys. This is from a 1995 album called Nemesisters. Babes in Toyland, and you probably know the song. Try and try and feel the irony in this. <laughs> Beyond and Babes in Toyland, the three-piece, all-female, kinder grunge band 
originally from Minneapolis. Their version of the Sister Sledge disco song, We Are Family, from their 1995 album, Nemesis Sisters. Grungish all-female bands were not only found in the U.S., just like we saw in Part 1, there's a very significant Canadian component to this whole thing. Take the case of Jail, a group which came out of the same stew in Halifax that produced Sloan. Four women in jail, Jennifer, Allison, Laura, and Eve. Put together all those first initials and you get Jail. They were formed in 1992 and were quickly signed to Sub Pop, which automatically brought them into the grunge fold. Their best album was their first, a 1994 release called Dream Cake, and here's a sample of that. This is Jail with Not Happy. From Halifax, the grunge-ish jail with Not Happy from 1994. Before we leave this era, we also have to hit the other end of the country to talk about Cub. Now, like Babes in Toyland, they were an all-female trio. They were formed while working at a radio station at the University of British Columbia. Cub specialized in a fun punk pop that often involved throwing candy into the crowd whenever they played live. Some people called it Cuddlecore. Isn't that cute? And remember how on the first program we talked about the importance and the influence of Josie and the Pussycats? Check out the cover of Cub's 1993 album, Betty Cola. The cover artwork was drawn by a guy by the name of Dan DiCarlo, the same guy who worked for Archie Comics and the guy who drew Josie and the Pussycats back in the day. This is from that CD. This is Cub and Motel 6. My parents want me to come home. Hanging out at the Motel 6 
Vancouver's Cub, one of the many all-female alt-rock bands that began popping up in the late 80s and early 90s in the wake of the whole grunge thing. When we come back, we're going to move into a related area, the concept of the Riot Girl. I'll try and explain what that was all about in just a couple of seconds. And then we're going to Japan. Hold on. You're tuned to the ongoing history of new music. This is the ongoing history of new music. Welcome back to part two of our look at the most important and most influential all-female bands in the history of new rock. Now, chances are that you've heard the term Riot Girl somewhere along the line over the last ten years. Let me define that. Riot Girl describes a scene, a sound, an attitude, and a subculture that first showed up in the early 1990s in the U.S. Northwest. It's equal parts feminism, political activism, punk rock girl power and emotional release. Song topics involved sexuality, gender issues, and awful stuff like rape and domestic abuse. In other words, it is the exact opposite of girly pop. It's loud, brash, outspoken, and sometimes harsh and shrill. In many cases, the message is more important than the music. Babes in Toyland and L7 and even Hole can be considered part of the whole riot girl scene, at least in terms of ideology and that spirit of sisterhood. Same thing with Joan Jett, going all the way back to her solo days and even her days with the Runaways. But the hardest of the hardcore Riot Girls remain underground because, frankly, there's not a lot of widespread mainstream commercial appeal in this music. The band at the center of the Riot Girl galaxy was Bikini Kill, a three-piece out of Olympia, Washington. The group grew out of a feminist fanzine, also called Bikini Kill. And yes, there was a guy in the group, a dude who went by the name of Billy Boredom, but in this context, he's pretty much superfluous. They you know, kind of stuck him and his guitar at the back. Bottom line, when you're talking about majorly important female groups, you are inevitably led to the Riot Girl scene, and from there you will be inevitably led to Bikini Kill. This is probably the most famous or infamous of all Bikini Kill songs. And I'm warning you, this is really intense. The song is called Suck My Left One.
Bikini Kill, and Suck My Left One. Before we leave the Riot Girl scene, I want to play uh, one more song. This time it's from Sleater Kinney. They've been around since about 1994 and are direct spiritual descendants from Bikini Kill. In fact, they're from Olympia, Washington, too. There are three women in the band, and Sleater Kinney is probably the most critically praised of all the Riot Girl groups. Writers just love this band. This track is from a 1996 album entitled Call the Doctor. It's called I Want to Be Your Joey Ramone. Leader Kinney from 1996, and I Want to Be Your Joey Ramone. Let's leave the Pacific Northwest and head across the Pacific to Japan. Yes, Japan. For whatever reason, we've seen several important all-female groups come out of the land of the rising sun. The first is a group that was another one of Kurt Cobain's favorites, Shonen Knife. Now, the best way to describe these people is to call them a Japanese female version of the Ramones, except that they were a trio and... Most of their songs were so, um, well, innocent. Three former office clerks, Mishi, Naoko, and Atsuko. They were formed in Osaka in late 1981 and eventually attracted a cult following all the way around the world. Their big break came in 1986 when they were included on a sub-pop compilation of indie bands. And from that point, Shonen Knife became this cool little secret shared by other indie bands, including Nirvana and Sonic Youth. In fact, Shonen Knife was booked as an opening act for Nirvana in the months before they released Nevermind. That's how much Kurt liked the band. And by 1994, they were touring with Lollapalooza and guest appearing on Beavis and Butthead. In other words, if you wanted to be indie and cool in the early 1990s, the quickest way to do that was to name-check Shonen Knife. Let me play something. I think you may know the song, but you may never have heard it done this way before. This... From Osaka, Japan, is shown a knife.
Most famous all female group to ever come out of Japan, Shonen Knife, doing a little bit of Carpenter's background, a tribute album in 1994. Shonen Knife may have been the most famous all female Japanese group, but they're certainly not the only one. If you're Quentin Tarantino, you'd probably prefer the Five, Six, Seven, Eights. They're an all female trio who specialized in a weird, campy surf rock. They often dress up in costume and make fun of themselves in Oriental rock. It's、uh, goofy, it's fun. Kind of like what we saw with the B 52s. That's pretty much the closest comparison I can make. And thanks to Quentin Tarantino, more people are taking notice. Ever see Kill Bill Volume 1? There's that scene in the nightclub with the live band that plays before Uma Thurman starts cutting everybody up? That's the 5678s. And thanks to that big screen appearance and their subsequent contribution to the Kill Bill soundtrack, the group picked up some extra work by licensing a song to a couple of TV commercials. Chances are. You'll recognize this from TV. And now you can put a name to everything. These are the 5, 6, 7, 8 s from 1996 with something called Woohoo! Three piece all female group called the Five, Six, Seven, Eights. And, and yes, the song is called Woohoo. And we're not done with all female Japanese groups. There's Chibo Mato, a New York based group with an Italian name who sometimes sings in fractured French. They have songs like White Pepper Ice Cream, Know Your Chicken, and Sci Fi Wasabi. It's very interesting and very weird. Chibo Mato. And then there's the Pizzicato Five, who are considered among the founding、uh, mothers. Of the Shubikai scene in Tokyo back in 1984, although the roots of this group can be traced all the way back to 1979. And although the number five is in the name, Pizzicato Five, there's really just two women in the group. There are a million Pizzicato Five albums, so there's a lot to choose from. This is a song that I've had burned to CD for my car for a few years because it's just,、uh, I don't know, odd. Pizzicato Five and Twiggy Twiggy. <laughs> I'm 
猫と一緒に」「三時間も待っていたのよ私猫と一緒に」Pizzicato 5 with Twiggy Twiggy. So, there's our detour through Japan. When we come back, we'll finish up by looking at a couple of the more active all female alt rock groups of today. Hold tight. You're tuned to the ongoing history of new music. This is the ongoing history of new music. Before we put the whole concept of the top all female new rock bands of all time to bed, we should look at a couple of groups who are making some waves today. And once again, we come across a Canadian group. One of the most brutally loud all female bands ever is originally from London, Ontario. If the Riot Girls worship Joan Jett, then Kitty's godmothers are Courtney Love and the women from L7, with a little death metal thrown in for good measure. I think that tells you something right there. All four women in Kitty got together while they were in their teens, in gym class, if you want to believe the legend. They started jamming on songs by Nirvana and Silverchair before graduating to writing their own stuff. And in 2000, they released an album called Spit. This is brutally hard rock, just as hard as you could get from any guy group. Check it out. This is called Brackish.
dismay, but times have changed, and so have you. I think I'd rather cruise it by the I'd like to take you down and show you deep inside my life, my inner workings. So smell and lack of inner pride to touch upon. The surface is not for what it seems. I take away my problems, but only I can. Kitty with Brackish from a 2000 album called Spit, which actually sold several hundred thousand copies. Last up is the Donnas, and we started this program with these people. And just like about everybody we've talked about during this show, they owe a debt to the Ramones. Bubblegumish rock dressed up with nothing more than three chords and an attitude. And a little ACDC and Motley Crue thrown in. Oh, and, and, and Judas Priest. Some of that's in there, too. Oh, and Riot Girl. Some Riot Girl stuff. They used to be called the Electrocutes, but when they started gigging professionally, they decided to become the Donnas in a tribute to the Ramones. See, all the women of the band are officially named Donna, hence the name. Get it? There's Donna A, Donna C, Donna F, and Donna R. Like Kitty, they got a record deal while they were still in high school back in the middle 1990s. In fact, they had to skip class for a week so they could tour Japan. And when they graduated, they signed up with Lookout Records, the same Bay Area indie label that discovered a little group called Green Day. A couple of albums followed around the turn of the century, and so did a turn on the Lollapalooza tour in 2003. This is from a 2004 album called Gold Medal.
the all-female California-based Donnas from 2004. A few final things about all-female rockers in just a sec. You're tuned to the ongoing history of new music. This is the ongoing history of new music. Back in the 1960s, the girl group was considered to be a cute novelty. Then the concept of female rockers was considered radical. It wasn't until the middle 70s that we began to see all-female rock groups. And it wasn't after the punk rock explosion of the 70s that people began to see all-female groups as anything less than weird. Thankfully, though, most of us are past that. All-female groups still aren't all that common, but at least there seems to be a genuine acceptance of the concept. For a lot of people, anyway. Obviously, we didn't cover all the groups that we could have. For example, Luscious Jackson, they should be included in this list. And there are many, many others who are doing some very fine work these days. When you consider the experience and the resistance featured by some of the women who paved the way, it's been an interesting and sometimes difficult journey. I mean, think about it. We've had to go from Josie and the Pussycats, a cartoon, to a band like Kitty. To quote that old cigarette ad, you really have come a long way, baby. Technical Productions by Rob Johnston. I'm Alan Croft. You've been listening to The Ongoing History of New Music, a Deep Sky production. 